Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Anti-Infective Services for Drug Discovery and Development. My name is Andrew Jernan, and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode and the presentation slides will advance automatically for you. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for you for future download. At this point, I would like to thank Eurofins Pan Labs who have helped develop the content for this presentation. Eurofins Pan Labs is a global CRO specializing in discovery pharmacology testing services. They've been in continuous operation for over 40 years, servicing the pharmaceutical and biotechnology community, settling the benchmarks for quality, convenience, and scientific expertise. Their mission is to provide pharmacological testing services that predict clinical effects. Eurofins Pan Lab's scientific portfolio consists of over 1,350 tests, ranging from molecular assays to cell-based models through proof of concept in vivo activity determination. They are an extension of their clients' capabilities, providing unrivaled pharmacological expertise and knowledge, superior data reliability, and innovative solutions for drug discovery. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for today's event, and that is Lynn Measel, PhD, Global Technical Director, Infectious Disease and Microbiology, Eurofins Pan Labs. Dr. Measel directs Eurofins Pan Labs Infectious Disease Portfolio of in vitro and in vivo services. Until 2011, she served at Merck Research Laboratories as collaboration lead in the Infectious Diseases Department. Her career focuses on lead discovery for novel antimicrobial and antiviral agents. She has led efforts in high-throughput screening, hit-to-lead evaluation, lead optimization programs, and mechanism of action work. Much of this work involved the characterization of antimicrobial agents for their in vitro properties and in vivo efficacy. Dr. Measle will provide an overview today of industry foci needs and strategies and provide rationale and context for discovery services offered by Eurofins Pan Labs and their partner, Eurofins Global Central Laboratories, to complement and facilitate the discovery and development of novel therapeutics. And without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to Dr. Lynn Measle. Dr. Measle, you'll be you can uh, begin your presentation when ready. And can my screen be seen? Yep, you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. So I want to thank the audience for joining this webinar on anti-infective services for drug discovery and development. These are services offered by Eurofins Pan Labs and Eurofins Global Central Laboratories. So Eurofins Pan Labs and Eurofins Global Eurofins Global Central Laboratories are partnering together to deliver to their clients full service support for their, for their discovery and clinical development of antimicrobial agents. In this talk, I will focus on the, the services of Eurofins Pan Labs and Eurofins Global Central Laboratories. I'll start out with an introduction of these organizations. Then I will review the unmet needs for novel antimicrobial agents and antifungal drugs and the strategies to discover these agents. And then we'll discuss the full spectrum antimicrobial services for preclinical drug discovery and then also clinical development. I'll overview the teams and their certifications and then we'll open up the webinar for questions. And I very much encourage the audience to submit your questions during this talk. So 
So I'm referring to the Eurofins PAM Labs and Eurofins Global Central Laboratories. Eurofins PAM Labs is a, is a contract research organization that focuses on preclinical services for efficacy and de-risking drugs or, or drug candidates. We have two centers of excellence in Bothell, Washington, and then also Taipei, Taiwan. PAM Labs has been performing in services for 41 years as a CRO. We service over 600 clients annually, testing over 50,000 compounds per year. And we've been performing microbiology services for 25 years now. Eurofins Global Central Laboratories focuses entirely on infectious disease drug development, and they're located in Chantilly, Virginia. They've been in service as a CRO for 25 years and, and, and focusing on anti-infectives for 17 years now. So PAM Labs focuses on preclinical proof of concept and de-risking of molecules in the discovery phase of, science, of drug discovery. We have over 1,500 testing protocols with molecular assays, including receptors, enzymes, and ion channels. And this includes the popular PAM Labs profiling service, again, for the receptors, enzymes, and ion channels that many in the pharmaceutical industry use for qualifying their leads for advancement. We also offer cell biology services for oncology, microbiology, and immunology and perform cell toxicity studies, including genetic toxicity, immuno, and cardiotoxicity. So here's an example of a gene tox assay. And we also perform cytotoxicity testing with both primary and immortal, immortalized cell lines. Here's an example of hepatocytotoxicity testing with, immortal, with primary hepatocytes. PAM Labs also has an outstanding in vivo pharmacology group that performs non-GLP studies. This includes anti-infectives, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, inflammation and allergy, metabolic endocrine, oncology, pain. And we also perform safety tolerability studies that's non-GLP and, and pharmacokinetic analysis. And the focus on the talk today is the anti-infective services and I felt it is useful to outline the overall organization because really the services for profiling cell toxicity all contribute to advancement of antimicrobial compounds. And the other therapeutic areas and the skills for those other therapeutic areas also feed into the development of in vivo efficacy models for anti-infectives. Eurofins Global Central Laboratories focuses on infectious disease drug development. They perform non-clinical microbiological testing, that is the development of testing methods and the QC for that, those methods. They perform organism susceptibility surveillance, both on a global and local basis, and susceptibility breakpoint determination. They also perform clinical trial microbiology phase one through phase three. I'm sorry, phase one through phase in, and then post-approval support. And I will outline this, these services in greater detail in later discussions. So again, Eurofins PAM Labs and Eurofins Global Central Laboratories are partnering to the, together to deliver to their clients full-spectrum antimicrobial services for drug discovery, clinical trials, and post-approval support. And in this talk, I will first review the, the preclinical testing services, followed by the, the clinical and, and post-approval testing services. I'll first start with the reviewing the unmet needs for antibacterial and antifungal agents and the discovery strategies that are used. Resistant bacterial infections are, are a primary focus 
of the antimicrobial drug discovery industry. In particular, the focus is on the development of new agents for treatment of serious hospital infections, um, including the pneumonia, skin and soft tissue, urinary tract, bloodstream, and intra-abdominal infections. And the Infectious Disease Society of America has defined organisms where resistance really is a particular concern, and that is the escape pathogens. These escape pathogens, Enterococcus, Staphylococcus, Klebsiella, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacter, E. coli, they represent 66% of the hospital infections, and there's a high frequency of resistance among those organisms, and that resistance in results in increased mortality or, or treatment failures. So MRSA, about 50% of um, hospital staph infections are MRSA. And now we have a great concern of emergence of beta-lactam resistance among the, the gram-negative bacteria, including carbapenem-resistant organisms, such as the metallo-beta-lactamase producers and DM1, which is still rather rare in the States and in Europe, but is an emergency, emerging concern, the KPC producers, and oxysilinase producers that are resistant to carbapenems. And these carbapenem-resistant organisms have very little susceptibility to most antimicrobial agents, and there's only a couple of antimicrobial agents that are available for treatment. So the discovery goals in this area are to develop new agents that are efficacious against the resistant organisms, and these, these agents must also be effective against the diverse pathogens that can be encountered in these different infection types. So multiple organisms in addition to resistant organisms. And a novel agent also has to have improved safety relative to the, the agents that are currently marketed. There's a variety of antimicrobial drug discovery strategies. One is to optimize existing classes so that they have improved efficacy against resistant organisms and improved safety profiles. And that is a popular approach, and there's a, a number of, of molecules in clinical advancement that uh, have demonstrated the, F, the, the validity of that approach. The other strategy is to develop new classes of antimicrobial agents that work by different targets. And there's a number of exciting examples of progress in this area of new agents that are in clinical advancement um, that act on novel targets. And then there's new treatment modalities, drug combinations, antisense RNA, biologics, peptides, phage genes and proteins, and vaccines that are providing an alternative approach for antimicrobial um, agents or prophylaxis. Clostridium difficile colitis is also an important area of research in the anti-infectives field. This organism is a spore-forming gram-positive anaerobe that produces a, a nasty toxin that causes severe diarrhea when the host's gut microbial flora has been wiped out by antibiotics. And C. difficile colitis has been on the rise over the past decade. You see in this, this plot below, uh, a well over five-fold increase in the incidence of C. difficile, and that uh, has also coincided with increased severity. There's over 14,000 deaths per year in the United States caused by C. difficile, and this is in part due to the emergence of more virulent organisms. There's therapies to treat C. difficile colitis, metronidazole, vancomycin, fidaxomycin, However, relapse is common, up to 20% of the patients. And the relapse uh, is often more fatal, particularly for the elderly. So the discovery goal is to develop new agents that spare the gut flora, um, that allows the gut flora to remerge and then prevent from recurrence of C. difficile colitis. And the approach here, there's a few few molecules in advancement, a lipopeptide, some translation inhibitors, and a novel mechanism of action compound that is very specific to Clostridium difficile. There's also a great deal of, of promise from the toxin antibody bodies that uh, appear to actually prevent re recurrence. 
Invasive fungal infections are another very important F, um, target area for infectious disease drug discovery. These organisms are a frequent cause of death in severely immune-compromised populations, including bone marrow transplant, cancer patients, um, immune-compromised populations. The current treatments for invasive fungal infections um, have serious liabilities, such as nephrotoxicity, drug-drug in interactions, and then limitations, such as in incomplete spectrum against important pathogens. Um, and then limited formulations, IV only, for example. The target pathogens are Candida and Aspergillus, although there are other um, atypical molds that are also uh, of, uh, that need to be covered. The discovery goals include developing an agent that's efficacious against both yeast and the filamentous fungi and the resistant organisms that also have reduced toxicity and reduced drug-drug interactions and have an IV and an oral agent or oral formulation so that the patient can take the drug in the hospital and then go home with the drug um, without needing an IV. So the challenge here really is in generating the agent that is, has the activity against these diverse organisms that are, are diverse both in cell morphologies and physiology. There's a few strategies that are ongoing. One is to optimize new triazoles or to develop new glucan synthase inhibitors. And there's other targets that are being explored for novel antifungal agents. So now we're going to advance to the, to the preclinical discovery and the assays that are involved in preclinical discovery and the services that are performed to support those efforts. And this slide shows a, a lead optimization campaign. I'm really focusing in now on lead optimization, where, where leads that are derived from high throughput screening or are derived from the literature go through medicinal chemistry, the iterative process, of developing structure activity relationships and in, in generating sequential improvement in lead activity to eventually advance through to generate a candidate for an IND. And this process involves screening to generate the biological data to support development of structure activity relationships. And these efforts typically involve a whole cell potency assay as a primary driver for lead optimization and, and also may include a target-based enzyme assay as a primary assay for lead optimization. Counter screens are often included with, for example, a human enzyme that is a, at risk of being hit by, by a particular structural class, and cytotoxicity against human cells. Molecular profiling is extremely useful to look at leads during optimization or prior to optimization to determine if there's any particular class of human enzymes, receptors, or ion channels that are vulnerable to being inhibited by this particular lead class. And then those types of assays would then be incorporated into the counter screening steps. So once an, a molecule has been generated that meets the criterion for potency and it has a sufficient selectivity profile in the counter screens, microbiological profiling is then addressed. And this looks at the spectrum of the, of the agent against a wide variety of organisms in clinical isolates. It determines if the agent is, kills the back microbe or if it has a static effect. These profiling studies look at combinations to see how the antimicrobial agent performs in combination with other drugs that might be dosed concurrently. 
And it also looks at resistance to see if resistance emergence may be uh, an issue. Mechanism of action studies are performed to make sure that the compound continues to act by the mechanism that it is thought to work by. In vivo studies are also performed to address efficacy in a rodent model, as well as pharmacokinetics. And then an attractive candidate that has the desired in vivo efficacy and in vitro potency profile would then advance to safety tolerability studies, including gene tox, which is important for many classes of antimicrobial agents, um, perhaps a um, maximum tolerated dose, and cardiovascular studies. And I want to point out here that Eurofins provides comprehensive preclinical services for anti-infectives that cover many of the needs that are um, assay needs that are encountered during lead optimization. I'm going to first start off with the whole cell potency assays. The most common whole cell potency assay that is used in screening is the MIC test, or minimal inhibitory concentration test. This is a simple growth, no growth assay that looks at a titration of compound, a compound titration to define that minimum concentration that inhibits bacterial growth. And this is typically performed with a, a set of organisms that re represent the target pathogens where activity is sought. At PAM Labs, we offer services with well over 100 strains for MIC screening. This includes aerobic bacteria, and the most common ones for primary screens are staph, streps, enterococcus, then the gram-negative E. coli, Klebsiella, and you know, bacter, pseudomonas. And MVC testing is available, which looks at viable counts in the growth-inhibited wells. We also perform MIC testing for anaerobic organisms, such as C. difficile and P. acnes, and microphilic organisms, um, Helicobacter pylori, and a variety of fungal strains, including Candida albicans and Aspergillus fumigatus. And I want to point out that, the, that this primary screen MIC assay is, can also be performed concurrently with the counter screening and cytotoxicity screening and molecular profiling that TAM Labs offers. The, the screening MIC test is again performed with a focused, focused set of pathogens. And again, it provides an initial spectrum profile. We use semi-automated liquid handling to test multiple pathogens. And we offer a two-week turnaround time to, uh, to provide rapid decision-making ability to drive medicinal chemistry programs. A one-week turnaround time is also available upon um, special request. We're currently expanding our screening collection to include resistant strains, such as NDM1 producers, and we're incorporating assay packages, such as a collection of gram-negative pathogens that would be commonly used, or collection of gram-positive pathogens. And this would help to facilitate ordering of the assay. And I want to point out that, that both Eurofin's global central labs and PAM labs can perform moderate throughput screening of compound sets with similar liquid handling facilities. And this is to test a, a, a much larger set of compounds. We offer a convenient web-based ordering catalog to look at prices and the assays that are available. It's going to be found on our website. And I recommend that you go to the assay catalog and then search on the, on the assay of interest. And then here with this search of Canada, we see that we have a number of Canada strains that are available for MIC testing, including azole-resistant clinical isolates, 
and an amphotericin B-resistant clinical isolate of Candida glabrata. We also have strains that are, are used for the, the infection model. So I'm now going to advance to the next section on in vitro microbiological profiling to qualify leads. The, the analysis of spectrum with a larger set of organisms is a very important analysis to first to estimate the spectrum and determine the potency of activity against organisms that are recently from the hospital and organisms that your drug would eventually encounter when it gets to the clinic. And this, active, this effort is very important to identify coverage gaps. And in this analysis, we recommend testing geographically diverse clinical isolates, including drug-resistant organisms. An analysis would usually look at at, at at least 20 organisms, up to 100 organisms in the lead optimization space. And, and this would be per species or pathogen group. And I want to emphasize that this really should be performed early in lead optimization. And in that way, any one can assess whether the group of organisms selected for the primary screen are truly representative of the organisms that are in the hospitals now. And I also wanted to point out that this assay is standard for an IND submission, so it is eventually required in, in advancement of your lead. Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories has ideal services for this analysis. They have a collection of over 200,000 geographically diverse um, patient isolates. These isolates are from multiple infection types. They also have clinical resistant isolates. And they also have susceptibility data that you can obtain from their database for existing antibiotics that have already been tested. Time kill assay is also a commonly performed study to determine whether an antimicrobial agent actually kills the organism or whether or not or whether it, it just causes growth inhibition. And this is an important assay for an IND submission. And it assay is also very useful for determining um, synergistic interactions. So this is a study of an ampicillin sulbactam combination. And in this study, antimicrobial agent is combined with a culture of test organism, and the viable count of the organisms are measured as a function of time. And a three log reduction in viable counts is con over 24 hours is considered to be bactericidal. And you see that the combination of amp sulbactam leads to rapid bactericidal effect whereas sub-inhibitory concentrations um, do not reduce bacterial counts. And this can be ordered on our assay catalog and is also a service that is offered by Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories. Drug combination studies are performed with a checkerboard analysis. This identifies synergistic in, in different or antagonistic drug interactions. It's an important evaluation to perform because our, your antimicrobial agent, when it's in the clinic, will likely to be co-dosed at some point with other antimicrobial agents. And so it's un important to know what are the interactions at the organismal level. And these studies are performed by doing a sequential titration of both agents and, and performing combinations of the two in a checkerboard fashion to determine MIC values of each agent at the concentration of the second agent. So this generates a series of MIC values at, uh, of a particular test agent at the concentration of another test agent. This generates um, fractional inhibitory concentrations 
and fractional inhibitory concentration index that determines whether it's an indifferent or a synergistic interaction. And we see from this analysis that ampicillin sulbactam um, generates largely synergistic interactions. Resistance analysis is also an extremely important study to perform, preferably early in lead optimization. And this study is meant to de-risk for the problem of rapid resistance emergence in the clinic. Um, it would be terrible to, to uh, produce a new drug and invest the, the resources in developing a new drug to find that resistance emerges extremely rapidly. And so this initial in vitro test performs, a, again, an initial assessment of resistance emergence where one grows the organism in, in broth culture, preferably multiple cultures, and plates onto medium containing drug at different concentrations, increasing concentrations, and also determines viable counts by plating onto medium without drug. And the number of organisms that grow up on the plate, which would be considered resistant variants, um, would be counted and determined relative to the number of viable counts. Again, this gives an initial assessment of the emergence, the frequency of emergence of spontaneous resistance in vitro, and a low frequency of resistance just adds confidence in the lead, whereas a high frequency of resistance would require significant um, investigation. And again, I recommend that this is performed early in lead optimization to de-risk, and it is a standard assay for an FDA submission. This type of work can be performed at Eurofins PAM Lab as well as Eurofin Central Global Central Laboratory. So I'm now moving on to the next step, and that is in vivo efficacy analysis. This is both efficacy and pharmacokinetics. I'm going to focus on efficacy. That's where our work is truly unique. And in designing an in vivo efficacy study, there's a number of considerations that will depend on the goal of the study. You know, is the study aiming to assess activity or potency? Is it ranking or rank ordering the candidates? Or is it selecting an indication? Or developing a, a proof of concept for a regulatory filing? And what I want to point out is that there's a number of parameters that have to be selected. The model, whether it's an immune competent or immune suppressed host, disseminated versus local infection, or survival versus an organ burden endpoint then the microbial strain, um, and that may be based on the sensitivity or resistance phenotype, um, in vitro potency against the strains, and the target indication that your one is seeking. And, and then, of course, the other consideration is how is the compound or agent going to be dosed? Uh, what is the route? What is the schedule? And urofins PAM lab offers tremendous flexibility to meet your study needs, so you have a, a, a lot of choices for the testing procedure. We offer assays with gram po a, a number of gram-positive and gram-negative organisms, as well as fungal species. Really, the most relevant pathogens are included in our set, and we have a few recent new launches, including our Clostridium difficile colitis model and a Pasteurella multocida model. Um, it's a new assay, and this is more for our animal health um, scientists. We offered a variety of inf infection types. That's bloodstream, a fecal puncture polymicrobial infection, colitis, that's the C. difficile hamster colitis model, lung infection, an ocular model, peritone peritoneal infection, skin, thigh, and, and vaginal infection. And the host species include hamsters, rat, and mouse. Most of the studies are performed with mouse, and the C. difficile colitis is with hamster. We've tested a variety of agents, including biologics, vaccines, 
RNAi and of course small molecules. And measurements would include either survival of a lethal infection, the measurement of organ bur um, of microbial burden in the tissue, and in some instances we've measured the frequency of resistance emergence in, in, in tissue as well as cytokine release. We offer a variety of dosing routes, including topical and continuous IV infusion. We have 38 catalog assays. And what it means to be a catalog assay is that it is optimized and it is ready for testing. We have a five-week turnaround upon compound receipt and the model is reproducible with minimal data scatter. We have data with control antibiotics that show dose responsive efficacy. And that data is available upon request. We also have custom methods that are readily implemented. Um, these custom inf infection models are ones that would be less um, typically requested, and so we, haven't, um, we don't have it ready to go off the shelf. Um, one example would be an ocular infection model or custom endpoints, such as resistance emergence, or that we can implement models with client-specified um, strains. Again, we have um, a number of models. Uh, this is the, the survival model catalog with gram-negative and gram-positive organisms, fungi, Clostridium difficile. And this is an example of the Clostridium difficile hamster model. In, in this, this model is performed with the ribotype 027 strain, NAP1. Um, we also have a ribotype 012 strain that's available upon request. And in, in this model, the hamsters are pretreated with clindamycin a day prior to infection. This, this uh, makes the animals susceptible to, to C. difficile by eradicating, or by eradicating the, the gut microbial flora. One day later, hamsters are infected orally with spores, and then dosing is initiated 16 hours later, and we observe daily for uh, 14 to 28 days. In this model, vehicle-treated animals typically succumb between four to six days post-infection. Again, dosing is from day zero to day five. It was vancomycin. Vancomycin's efficacious for seven additional days in preventing lethality. However, the animals do eventually succumb, and this is presumably due to recurrence, perhaps by ingestion of spores in the environment. And there's a dose titration observed. Higher concentrations of vancomycin um, yield less recurrence. We're very enthusiastic about this model, in part because we feel it's, it's similar in features to the human model. Uh, and we are also very enthusiastic about implementing a model with mouse for the need, um, and the benefit there is to have a smaller host for performing testing, and that model is coming soon. We also have a variety of tissue burden models performed with gram-negative and gram-positive organisms, and these use immune-suppressed hosts, typically. This is an example of a tissue burden model performed with Acinetobacter baumannii um, with a lung infection model. Animals are infected either intranasally or intratracheally, and then two hours post-infection, they're dosed and then 24 hours after dosing, tissue is harvested and plated, and bacterial counts are, are measured. And this shows a plot of the bacterial counts as a function uh, at, for different study groups. These models are optimized um, so that the, the inoculum size is correct to yield a two-log increase, at least um, between the two-hour and, and final time point. That ensures that the organisms are growing. And we also um, select inoculum sizes that minimize data scatter. And we uh, um, perform validation studies to show dose responsive efficacy. So 
So I'm going to close up the dis discovery activities discussions with a description of our safety tolerability, both in vitro and in vivo. This really is oh, material for an entire webinar. So I'm just going to go over this lightly. There are a number of assays that are commonly performed in antimicrobial programs, including you know, for in vitro safety, of course, cytochrome P450, cardiac toxicity with, with, um, to, to look at QT prolongation or predict, um, predict QT prolongation, in particular with the herg ion channel. And this is performed with either QPatch or PAT, the gold standard patch express methods. We perform molecular profiling of receptors, ions, and enzymes um, with the PAN Labs safety profiling assays. We also perform cell-based toxicity methods using cell proliferation and, op and apoptosis enzyme points. And, and these are performed with either primary or immortalized cell lines, and there's a wide variety of cell lines to choose from. We also per perform gene tox assays with the in vitro micronucleus assay. AIMS assay is a, an option, but it's really not relevant for an antimicrobial compound. In vivo non-GLP safety toxicity, that is, again, they're non-GLP. Um, there's the maximum tolerated dose, which looks at mortality, clinical observations, and CNS observations. There's, cardio, uh, there's models for cardiovascular and respiratory monitoring, clinical chemistry, histopathology, the release of cytokines, and necropsy are available to augment these types of MPD studies, and toxicokinetic studies are also available. I'm going to move on now to the drug development and product support discussions of, of this talk for clinical and post-approval drug, um, drug development. Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories performs both non-clinical microbiology as well as clinical microbiology. And non-clinical microbiology is performed concurrently with clinical trials. Some of these assays are the same as those that are performed in lead optimization. That's including time till, the studies of synergy antagonism, resistance. And clients often look at the post-antibiotic effect. Um, a very important aspect of the non-clinical microbiology work is to establish the test methods for susceptibility and to QC those methods. And there's two general types of methods that are performed um, and, and, and tested at Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories. That one is the DISC method, shown here on the right, and then the BROF MIC method. And with the DISC method, one needs to determine how much test agent is put into the DISC. That's what we call a DISC mass development study. And then for the subsequent studies would be to correlate the results from the DISC study with BROS MIC to determine how the zone of inhibition correlates with an MIC value. Other studies would establish MIC methods with prepared, frozen, or dried MIC panels and would assess the quality of those panels relative to, stand, relative to other standard methods. And then the QC evaluation would be performed to look at the QC ranges of control strains with the broth and the disk zone method. And there's three tiers that are part of the CLSI M23 process that are performed at Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories. Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories also performs the global and local surveillance of patient isolates to determine MIC50, MIC90. That's the MIC that inhibits 50% of the bacteria, the MIC90 that 90% of the 90% of the organisms 
and then the range of MIC values. And they use an, an extensive network of sites worldwide. They then use the MIC distribution data from the surveillance work to generate, in combination with human PK PD data, an MIC breakpoint determination. That is the criterion for census, and the MIC criterion to be defined for an organism to be defined as sensitive or as an immediate or resistant to an antimicrobial agent. So all of these services are, and very comprehensive services, are performed at Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories. The clinical trial microbiology and post-approval surveillance that Eurofin's performs includes clinical trial for regulatory sub submission as well as post-approval surveillance. And the process here is to obtain clinical specimens from their Eurofin's global network of sites, obtain specimens, determine organis organism ID, and archive them, perform antimicrobial susceptibility testing using pretty much all methods, and perform molecular characterization. So Eurofin's does the project management data management, and they arrange the courier of, of the strain shipment, et cetera. And then they provide scientific guidance of the project and consultative work with the clients. For post-approval surveillance, susceptibility is continued to be monitored to see how MIC ranges change with time and also to support new indications. And Europeans has had over 40 surveillance initiatives that they have designed and conducted. So great, greatly experienced in this area. So I'm going to close with a summary of the ANAF Infectives teams and our certifications. At Europeans PAM Labs, um, we have a, a, a group of team members and managers the anti-infectives work is done in Taipei, Taiwan, with a team of scientists that have been doing anti-infectives work for really quite a long time. We have terrific, terrific stability of our, our, our teams because PAM Labs is a highly sought employer. We have six microbiologists on staff with an average of 10 years of experience, as well as highly experienced veterinarians. Uh, technical directors such as myself, Gonzalo Castillo, and Usha Warrior oversee, in my case, the anti-infectives. Gonzalo oversees the in vitro pharmacology, and Usha oversees the cellular toxicology services that contribute to anti-infectives discovery. And we oversee the, the projects from start to finish and contribute to project design. And we have a BL2 facility that's a, approved for use of BL2 organisms, multi-drug resistant pathogens, and GMOs. Uh, we're certified by NIH OLAO so that our work can, um, can support NIH-funded projects. Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories also has a, a, quite an established team of scientists that lead projects and, and perform laboratory work, of course, in the logistics, project management, and data management. And they are fully accredited for performing the clinical trial microbiology work. And so I want to summarize here that Eurofin's PAM Labs and Eurofin's Global Central Laboratories are teaming together to provide full spectrum antimicrobial services. And what I've shown is that we support discovery, clinical, and post-approval support. We perform microbiology work, that's MIC testing, antimicrobial characterization, the in vitro and in vivo pharmacology services, um, DMPK and non-GLP safety and microbiological test method development, QC, and microbiological su surveillance to support uh, a, uh, um, a regulatory submission. So the benefit of working with a full of the full spectrum services is that a single CRO provider facilitates your project management. And this 
can serve for the client. It can serve them time, personnel research, and costs, and it prevents headaches. It simplifies sample shipment logistics. And our experienced team of, of scientists and our already optimized methods serve to improve your study outcomes. We generate consistent and high quality microbiological data. And our scientific experts deliver accurate results and consultative direction. Our, our projects are, are, are reviewed by subject matter experts that provide ongoing oversight of the data and the, the study activities. And we are committed to flexibility and convenience. We customize your studies to meet your scientific and your budgetary needs. And we have streamlined our process over many years of experience. Um, for efficiently generating a study design, efficiently generating a quotation, sample shipment goes smoothly, and data reporting are designed to really simplify your work. For future directions, you can contact us. And this is, this is the information for contacting us at PAM Labs. If you have questions that are specific for Eurofin's Global Central Laboratory, we, we will forward those questions to, to Dan Som and his team. And you can meet us at ICAC. We have a booth. Eurofins has a booth at number 213. And there's a few poster presentations. Um, I'm giving a poster from my former Merck work on Wednesday. And then the Global Central Laboratories team are also presenting. And so we look forward to meeting you in the future. And at this point, I open up the discussion for questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Measel. We can now begin our Q&A session. And I would like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions and comments in right now using the questions window for this, the Q&A portion of the webinar. And we're lucky to also have uh, Don Axworthy from Eurofins Pan Labs and Dan Som uh, from Eurofins Global Central Laboratories to take some of your questions as well. So I've already received some of your questions, so I'll start with those. Uh, first question, would you mind telling uh, what are the cardiovascular disease models uh, that are available at Eurofins Pan Labs? I think that Don Axworthy would best answer that question. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, yeah. Cardiovascular safety in the context of antimicrobial agent uh, development is is highly relevant. So uh, we do offer cardiovascular safety uh, in terms of the ion channel and herd work that Lynn pointed out. Um, we also have the ability to look at uh, uh, safety in undisturbed animals, that's uh, telemetrized rats and guinea pigs, to get direct and, and highly relevant measurements of QTC interval, uh, which, as Lynn mentioned, is the primary concern with uh, different classes of agents in this therapeutic area. Additionally, and, and I think more to the point of the, uh, uh, the question, cardiovascular safety. Uh, we can look at genetically uh, defined uh, species that have been developed to develop uh, uh, hypertension, uh, uh, salt-sensitive rats, things like that. But I'm not sure that that uh, is the most relevant in the context of antimicrobial agent development, but we do have hypertensive models in rodents uh, and a great deal of experience uh, measuring cardiovascular parameters in those animals. And additionally, in terms of general safety, we can look at all relevant clinical chemistries uh, on a non-GLP basis in mice, rats, guinea pigs, hamsters. Um, I think that's the most succinct answer to the question. Thanks, Lynn. Great, and thank you. Um, our next question here, an audience member says, I'm interested in a lung infection animal model. Uh, can you uh, share some more uh, insight on that, please, if you have any? We have lung infection models with a variety of organisms. And if, we can, if you can give, return my slides, I can, 
I can sh show the different organisms that we test. Well, actually, so Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas. Oh, here, I turn on my slide screen. I'll, I'll scroll to that. We have, we have lung models with a variety of pathogens, and we can happily send you a list of those organisms, but that includes Streptococcus with a, with a lethal infection model, and then for or, with organ burden as an endpoint, we do that with, with, with Klebsiella pneumoniae, with Acinetobacter, and Pseudomonas, and then for um, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, again, Streptococcus is with survival as a readout. And these models are all fully optimized so that they, the correct inoculum size is delivered. It yields an increase in microbial counts with time. And um, they're dose responsive um, with regard to standard antimicrobial efficacy. We've also tested can, um, aspergillus in a lung bottle, but that's not a cataloged assay at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question, um, audience member here says, I am developing a novel antimicrobial that is also a potent antioxidant drug. Uh, what sort of immunocompetent models would be suitable for testing uh, the dual action of the drug? Your thoughts? That's very interesting. So immunocompetent models, are most of our immunocompetent models are with, with, vi with survival of a lethal infection as an endpoint. We, we, and we offer that model for pretty much any bacterial or fungal pathogen. And we also ha can test immune competent Pseudomonas rugosa in a lung infection model, it's not quite ideal. It's a little bit more hard, more difficult to establish an, an infection where you're measuring bacter bacterial or fungal counts in tissue um, in immune competent animals. Um, it can be done, and there's methods. So for most of our models where we're looking at um, immune competent animals with measurement of organ burden, so bacterial or fungal counts in tissue, um, that would be custom because we would need to do some additional method development. OK, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this audience member says, we noticed that the website uses um, SC delivery of clindamycin and 100 to 220 spores in the hamster C. difficile model. Uh, the webinar explained this as a clinda delivery by IP uh, with 10,000 spores. Uh, just wondering about the difference and why. Okay. We actually have different models for C. difficile. And the, um, so the, the webinar was with, a, um, was with the 027 strain. And that strain is less virulent in hamsters, and so we need a larger inoculum size. So we did an initial study to determine the, ino the optimal inoculum size required to consistently yield a lethal infection. And 10 to the fifth spores was required for the 027 strain. For the 012 strain, that, that strain is phenomenally virulent. And only 100 organisms are 100 spores are needed to induce a lethal infection in 99% of the animals. And so that explains the inoculum variation. And as far as the clindamycin dosing, that may be just a, a difference that was chosen on, on that particular day. I believe that the clindamycin dosing route is, is flexible. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, and thank you for that presentation as well. We have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If you do have any further questions, please direct them uh, to Dr. Measle's email address showing on your screen. That's lynnmeasel at eurofins.com. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event.
A survey window will be popping up on your screen, and your participation is appreciated as it will help improve our further webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speaker, Dr. Lynn Measle. We hope that you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.